The kids are dismissed. The teachers are in the back. Those of you who are still with me, I'm going to ask that you turn with me to the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, which if you're using one of these Bibles, it's on page 101. It's kind of interesting for me, um, <clears throat> I didn't really realize this till this morning, that my Bible is set up exactly the same way the Bibles you have under the chairs are. I, you know, I've been doing this, what, for two, two years now, a year and a half, whatever it is. I just realized it's set up the same way. So I can just tell you what page, and if you don't have a Bible or you want one, just grab the one that's uh, in the chairs, and it'll, be, it'll match up. It's great to be back with you all. Uh, my wife and I, we had a chance to head east to visit with our son and some old friends in Maryland. My, my son was just inducted into his high school's athletic hall of fame for his uh, years of lacrosse, both on the high school, college, and uh, professional levels. And uh, it was just great seeing some of my, the old teachers I used to uh, teach with and some of my students that I, that I had. And it was wonderful seeing uh, our friends as well. Oh, okay, what was it? But in Leviticus chapter 23, we're focusing in on the festival of Sukkot. As you know, that there are seven festivals, main festivals, that the Jewish people observe. And all of these festivals, and for that matter, really all of the Word of God, is basically about two things. It's about Messiah, who He is, why He would come, and how to recognize Him. The entire Bible focuses, focuses in on one individual of all of time and space, Yeshua the Messiah. A correlating theme that is attached to that of Messiah's coming is the need that we have as human beings. The reason for His coming is because we are alienated from God. We are not united to God. Generally, we don't really think about that. We just go on our way through our lives in the course of history and we do the things that we do, whether it's on the job or at home or at play, and uh, we just go through life, morning by morning, evening by evening. And there are moments, I suppose, when we consider, is there more to this existence than what I am presently experiencing? Is there, in effect, a purpose for my life. And so the Bible is really about these two things. It's about Messiah who is to come, about the purpose for which God has made human beings in His image. It answers the question why it is that we oftentimes feel as if our life is just mechanical and without real purpose. And that's because a thing has crept into our world that the Bible refers to as sin. It's not just the actions we perform that fail to glorify God, but it's also a principle that's been unleashed in our world that impacts us on every level. Not least of which, the level of, why am I here? It's when God opens our heart to Him that we realize that all the things that we counted significant and all the things that we thought were the reason for which we were here weren't those things at all. But really, we're here for one purpose, and that's to glorify God, to worship God, to love Him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength as we recite every week here in our liturgy. That's the reason why God has created us in His image. Certainly to enjoy Him and the world around us. But the things we do are a means to an end, not the end in and of itself. They are meant to be aspects of our life by which we can glorify God. Whatever our occupation might be, whatever our thoughts would be, whatever our goals might be. And so we need to have sort of a fresh vision, an opening of our heart, soul, and mind to the reality of God 
that we would come to grips with the reason for our own existence in the world that he has made and which he has made for us to enjoy. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles is all about this because it's the concluding celebration, the concluding festival of the seven major festivals that Israel was to observe. All seven point to Messiah. And all seven tell us of our reason for being here, to worship Him, to glorify Him, and to love Him. So that when we've looked at the first four festivals, Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, and Shavuot, Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost, all of those festivals clump together in the springtime of the year within 49 days of each other are meant to alert us to the redemptive career of our Messiah, the redemptive ministry of our Messiah, what Messiah was to do in order to provide for us, enabling us to be united to God and no longer alienated from Him. So in a way, it's His priestly ministry. That is to say, the priests in Israel were the mediators of God's purposes to us, His law, for example, and mediated our need for Him as they represented the people before God. So they were sort of these intermediaries that represented God to the people and the people to God. But when you get to the remaining three festivals in Leviticus chapter 23, the Feast of Trumpets, we refer to it today as Rosh Hashanah, because we celebrate the new year, as it were. And then when 10 days later, we observe Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And then another five days or so, we begin to celebrate Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Booths. Those three festivals do not speak about Messiah in his priestly ministry, his redemptive ministry, but it speaks about Messiah in his royal ministry, his judicial ministry, his coming to reign as king. And so the Feast of Trumpets tells us of how God, before the king comes, would gather his people from the four corners of the earth, in which the scriptures tell us will occur with the sounding of the shofar. Isaiah 27 mentions that. And of course, a number of passages in the Brit HaDashah, the New Covenant Scriptures, make reference to it as well. That regathering of the Jewish people, which in my opinion we are seeing the beginnings of, 1948 and 67 and 73 and 1980, and today in the 21st century, the Jewish people have their homeland. The Jewish people for the first time since the time of the Romans have more Jews living in Israel than outside Israel. And this is all an indicator to me of God's moving the pieces of history to bring about His purposes and His plans. It begins with Israel's regathering before the King would come. It includes a purging of Israel in preparation for the king. And so Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, a day of judgment, is a day in which Israel will experience a challenging, a tribulation period of sorts, unlike any that the world has ever known. Yeshua says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. He tells us nations will rise up against nations. There will be war against, war against one peoples against another. Some have suggested this phrase, nation against nation, suggests more than just a local conflagration, but a worldwide conflagration. It's interesting, in the 20th century, for the first time, we have the World War I's and the World War II's. And now we no longer need to refer to any wars as world wars because they engage the entire world in one means or another. And so Yom Kippur is a time of unprecedented trial that's to come against God's chosen people. Zechariah chapter 13 tells us two-thirds of the entire nation 
will suffer under the hands of the nations at that time. But that will give way to the festival of Sukkot. Because the festival of Sukkot is the celebration of the dwelling presence of God. It's the time in which we celebrate God dwelt among His people in a booth, a tabernacle in the wilderness when His own people dwelt in tents, temporary structures that the Jewish people would live in for 40 years en route from Egypt to the Promised Land. The festival of booths requires that all Jewish people for seven days live in these structures that were to be made out of wood and covered over with these bows, these leaves, these frogs, these palm branches that would cover the top of the sukkah. The booth was intentionally made so that it was very, somewhat precarious, somewhat delicate and fragile. The palm branches on the top were to be dense enough that there'd be some shade to remind us of the Shekinah glory, the cloud by day that shaded Israel from the intense heat during the wilderness wandering. But it was to be porous enough that at night you could look through in order to see the stars in heaven, to remember God is ever watchful and ever caring for His people. Be fragile enough to remind us that we cannot endure this life on our own merits or our own strength, but needing the strength and fortitude and support of God. And so the booth was to remind us of the dwelling presence of God in the midst of fragility of life. And so Israel for 40 years so lived as did God in a tabernacle, as it were, through the wilderness with his people. The Feast of Tabernacles was also unique because it occurs in the winter time, fall, winter in Israel. This is the rainy season. From now, October through around February, March is the era of the time when there would be the former rains. And if Israel was blessed by God, the Lord would send the latter rains, which would come in the spring. And if Israel received both the former and latter rains, rains their crops would grow. The vegetation would get dense, and there'd be incredible harvest and produce provided in the land of Israel. It all depended upon God, because Israel, unlike its neighbors, didn't have a main waterway. It didn't have a Nile River. It didn't have a Euphrates or a Tigris River. It had a Jordan River all the way on its eastern border. But throughout the land of Israel, there are no main rivers. They had wadis. And wadis are dry riverbeds that become rivers if there's enough rain. And so if we cry out to God and we are obedient to God and we're blessed by God, he might provide us with both the former and latter rains, and our land would give greatly for us. But it's God who must enable this to occur in order for us to be so blessed. So on Sukkot, there are prayers for rain that are expressed in the synagogue, but in the time of Messiah, in the temple. And there were unique ceremonies around the altar as the offerings would be offered. The first day of Sukkot, the Jewish priests would go out to the Kidron Valley, the Valley of Jehoshaphat, the valley that separated the Mount of Olives from the city of Jerusalem, Mount Zion. And they would gather the bows that are symbolized, for example, in our, our lulav. And... So they would gather these branches, these lulav branches and these willow branches and the, the variety of green that is provided by these uh, waterways in the Kidron Valley where the water would, like a wadi, would collect. And they would take these greens and on the altar they would erect a sukkah booth over the altar. 
And as they would erect the sukkah booth, the priests and the people of Israel with the lulavs in hand would circle the altar and they'd be shaking the lulavs in all directions in prayer to God that the Lord would provide them with the rain and the sustenance, the needs that they would have. On Sukkot, they would um, offer up 70 bulls as an offering for the nations. Because in Genesis chapter 10, you read of the nations that are listed. There are 70 such nations that are mentioned. And so the rabbis were mindful that God's redemptive desires is not just limited to Israel, but to all nations of the world. And thus on this occasion, the Jewish people will offer up 70 bullocks on the, in the, on the altar for the 70 nations that atonement might be provided for them as well. And on this occasion, the book of Jonah would be read by the Jewish people. Because the book of Jonah is the one and only prophet in Israel sent to the Gentiles. He's told to go to Assyria, to the people of Nineveh, and to proclaim the word of God. The only Jewish prophet sent to the Gentiles. And so because this is a time in which we await the coming of Messiah, when all nations will worship the king, so an offering is offered for all nations. And the book of Jonah is read to remind us of God's love for the nations as well as his love for the people of Israel. Unfortunately, Jonah was not as happy about the Gentiles as God was. And so we too need to get ourselves straight with God to be happy about the things that makes God happy. And redemption is the thing that makes God most joyous. Remember what Yeshua said? That, you know, just like uh, a shepherd leaves the 99 to find that one, so he says there's more joy in heaven over one individual that repents than the rest that remain faithful. Because God loves and is overjoyed by redemption. And especially when it is experienced, and not just provided, but experienced, it brings joy to God's heart and to the entire inhabitants of the heavenly realm. And so on this occasion, we offer the sacrifices for the nations. We read the book of Jonah to remind us of God's concern for the nations. And on this occasion, unique menorahs were erected in the court of the women. And there were four menorahs that had four bowls in them, huge bowls that would hold gallons of oil. And they would erect these ladders to these menorahs. And the youthful priests, the priests that were still in good shape, would climb those ladders with gallons of oil held on their shoulders. They'd climb to the top and they'd pour the oil into those bowls. And then they would take old Levitical uh, garments and they would use those garments as wicks and they'd lay them into the bowls and they would light the menorahs and it would give light to the entire temple area. It would reflect off the sandstones of the temple, the marble columns that housed the holy place and the holy of holies, and it would be reflected out to the city of Jerusalem, and thus the city of Jerusalem was referred to as the city of gold. When you hear the, uh, th that old it was folk song, you know, that was, what, what was the title of it? Uh, Jerusalem of gold. It's not talking about the golden dome of the uh, Mosque of Omar. It's talking about the golden hue that was reflected off of the menorahs that were lit on, on Sukkot. And the rabbi said, you know, that with the light that was emanating from the temple, with the joyous reciting of the Psalms and the celebration in the temple around the altar and the dance and the singing, they said there was such joy in Jerusalem and in Israel like none other in all the world. And they said if anyone has never experienced such joy, they don't know what joy is. And thus joy is one of the major themes in terms of the emotional component of this festival. It's to be a time of celebrating God who in all of His glory dwells among His people, in all of His grace provides for them 
And whatever our condition, he dwells among us, with us, besides us, and now through Messiah in us. Whatever the struggle, challenge, difficulty might be that we face. This is a festival of hope. And it's the climax of all. It's no accident that nearly every book of the Bible has a reference to Sukkot. Maybe not the festival, but the term Sukkot is used over and over again. It's almost as if the writers wanted us not to lose sight of where history is headed. History is headed to the coming of the King who will dwell among us, who will reign in Jerusalem, who will rebuild the temple, and who will be acknowledged by Jew and non-Jew alike as the Messiah of Israel and the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. This is a festival that Jewish people were to pilgrimage to. Three times a year, Jewish men were to come up to Jerusalem on Passover, on Shavuot, and on Sukkot. And so this is a time of gathering. One of the names for the festival in the Bible is the ingathering. And so the Jewish people gather together. They come up to Jerusalem. It's one of the reasons why there's a lot of tours that go on in Israel during this time. It's one of the reasons why a lot of believers like to go to Jerusalem during this time, to go up to Jerusalem to celebrate the king on Mount Zion and to rejoice in what he's provided. Now, I just want to draw your attention to two other passages. There's so much that could be said about this. It's almost like you have to sort of have a Bible study on this before you can preach on it to appreciate all that's going on. But I want to draw your attention to an interesting passage that's related to Sukkot, but not oftentimes read in connection with it. If you turn with me to one of the minor prophets, we're looking at Amos the prophet. Joel, Amos, Obadiah. If you're looking at one of the Bibles here that's provided, we're on page 771. When Amos draws his book to a close, just as a highlight, he says, In that day, I will raise up the sukkah of David that is fallen. My translation says the booth, but it's the word sukkah. He uses the word sukkah to denote the Davidic dynasty. And he specifically uses, in my opinion, uses the word sukkah to draw our attention to the feast of Sukkot. Because it will be during the Feast of Sukkot that the Davidic dynasty, the Davidic king, will be established forever. His dynasty is already established forever, but the king has not yet come. And after the deportation of the last king of Israel, Zedekiah, to the Babylonians, Israel has not had a Davidic king on the throne in Israel. Amos is telling us there's going to come a time in the latter days, which is a phrase for the end of days, when the Lord is going to raise up the sukkah of David. He's going to do this during the time or in association with Sukkot, when Sukkot will be celebrated in the Messianic age, rejoicing over the king who dwells in our midst. Amos is drawing our attention. He's saying, listen to these words carefully. He, doesn't just, he could have said, when I raise up the dynasty, raise up the descendant, raise up the son. He could have said any of those words and would have meant the same thing, but he doesn't. He says, I'm going to raise up the sukkah of David. He's telling us what sukkah, sukkot, represented was the promise of the coming king. And so he's telling us the climax of history is going to come. And the festivals will find their fulfillment and completion. And notice what he says. He's going to raise up the booth, the sukkah of David that has fallen. So notice, this is right in accordance with what we've seen. The dynasty has been lopped off. The dynasty has fallen. There hasn't been a Davidic king over the throne of Israel since 600 B.C. or B.C.E before the time of Messiah. We're looking at almost 3,000 years has gone on or so, right? 21, 2,700 years 
has gone on with no Davidic king. It has fallen. When will the Davidic king come? At a time of David's dynasty's fallenness. And this is exactly what we are seeing in our own day and have seen for a long time. Notice what else he says. He will repair its breaches. He will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. There's coming a time when the king will come, the dynasty will be rebuilt, and the throne will be established. Look what he else he says in verse 12. And they, that they may possess the remnant of Edom. Edom is the name for Esau. Esau was, for a time, the enemy of Jacob, his brother. And so Edom is actually a term denoting the nations in general. And what he's saying is, at the time when the dynasty of David is restored, when the Messiah will come, when the king will appear, then they will possess the land of their enemies. They will possess the remnant of their enemies. In other words, no longer will their enemies be able to triumph over them. But not only this, get this. And all the nations, there's the parallelism, Edom and the nations, and all the nations who are called by my name declares the Lord who does this. Notice that. The nations now are called by my name. Not only will the Davidic dynasty be raised up, not only will the nations no longer terrorize and harm the Jewish people, but now the nations will belong to God. He says they will be mine. They will be called by my name. That means to say this is the time when the nations of the world will be converted to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When the nations of the world will embrace the Jewish Messiah. Zechariah tells us, ten men will grab the coat of him who is a Jew and say, let us go with you, for we have heard God is with you. And this is what Amos is telling us. The nations will be converted to the true faith. They will love what God loves. And so they will love God's people. And they will no longer terrorize them or harm them. But that's not all Amos says. He tells us this, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper, I love this imagery, and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. What he's telling us is the land will be so blessed that by the time they finish plowing the land, they're going to be harvesting the crops. We just plowed, we'll get going again because we just harvested there's going to be so much stuff that we can't keep up. And that's why he says, the people who are treading the grapes, they're going to say, hey, we, the wine's already here. You know, you're treading too slow. Let's go. We got to, it's going to be overflowing so much. And so there's going to be an overabundance of blessing as God pours out His grace on His people. But that's not all. That alone would be pretty fun, wouldn't it? But that's not all. He says, the mountains shall drip sweet wine and all the hills shall flow from it. You know, Israel's a hilly place. There are some plains, but most of it's pretty hilly. And so what you have in Israel, and you see this very beautifully on the Mount of Olives, it's terraced. And on the terracing that is developed, you have the olive groves. But here he's talking about the terracing for the vineyards. And he's saying there's going to be so many mountains that will be terraced with vineyards that will be as if the mountains themselves are just dripping with wine. Dripping with the juice of the grapes. You guys like grapes? <laughs> I haven't met anyone that, I don't like grapes, man. Don't put them on my salad. I don't eat grapes. But grapes is like a universal fruit, you know? Everybody loves grapes. And it's going to just be so many grapes. It's like an overabundance. It's no accident that when the spies came out of Egypt, I mean out of Israel, and they show to Moses and Aaron and the people how wonderful the land is, what do they bring back? They've got this spit, right? This, this uh, stick or whatever on their shoulders that's just overflowing with, you would expect something really heavy, but it's grapes. And so that's why, by the way, that's the, one of the symbols for the land of Israel. Amos is telling us the Davidic dynasty will be restored. The king 
will come. The nations will no longer harm the Jewish people. The nations will be converted to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The land will just be overflowing with all this good stuff. Grapes and crops and, and oil and flowers. The desert will bloom. All this stuff. In fact, Ezekiel tells us the Dead Sea will be a place for the spreading of nets. The Dead Sea will no longer be just this place of all kinds of potash and or potash, however they pronounce it, minerals. It will become a fresh water body. And the fishermen will be down there fishing out of the Dead Sea. I don't know if you've ever been to the Dead Sea, but there's no life there. That's why it's called the Dead Sea. And the salt that accumulates. You know, there are research vessels on that sea. Every morning for hours, they got guys that dive in special suits, with these sledgehammers, you know, these, these single-handled sledgehammers, having to bang the salt off the rudders and off the gear because it just forms like that. Because the minerals, it's so dense. So much salt, by the way, is produced. You go down to Israel, you go down to the Dead Sea, you will see mountains of salt. I mean mountains of salt. Because there's so much of it, it's almost like it's worthless. And so as they get the other minerals, they have to take the salt, and they keep putting it out to the side, and there are mountains of it. People hike on these accumulations of salt down at the Dead Sea. And it's so mysterious that as you go further south of the Dead Sea, the salt just begins to grow, you know, because of the evaporating process, the heat, and, the, and they're just the, it's like you're on another planet. But all that said... The scriptures are saying that the land will produce gloriously. He doesn't know, and look at what else he says. He says, I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. So the cities of Jerusalem, the cities like Tel Aviv and Haifa, and all throughout the land of Israel will be built up and re-inhabited if they have. We've seen some videos of Israel, haven't we? It's utterly amazing. It's almost like you're in New York City in some of these places. Because the Lord said he would do this. We're seeing it unfold in our day, but it will come to the greatest height when Messiah comes. But that's not all. They'll plant vineyards, drink their wine. No one will take it from them. They shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them. So there's no dispute the land of Israel belongs to the Jews. I mean, he tells us here and over and over again. But what's interesting is they will never again be uprooted. When Messiah comes, all comes to fruition. And that's what Sukkot is all about. Now, one last thing, and time has run beyond. But one last thing. How is it that God makes this happen? Scripture tells us. Ezekiel 37, we've looked at this, the Valley of Dry Bones. Isaiah tells us this. With joy they shall um, bring up waters from the well of salvation, he says, Isaiah chapter 12. Yeshua tells us the very same thing that the rabbis and the prophets have said. If you look, you don't have to turn there now, but if you look at John chapter 7, you will see Messiah celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. It's one of my favorite passages. When I was in seminary, I preached on this because I love this passage so much. Never forget when I, they videotaped us in those days, and I, even to this day, I don't look at my videos. I think maybe it was because of that class. And in the midst of it, and they said, take your wife with you to see the video because they'll give you an honest evaluation. I said, no, 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 time out, time out. So Mary Lou and I, were sitting there, we're watching this. There were two crazy things. One was my left arm wouldn't move. Like I'm constantly doing this thing. And in the midst of the sermon, I actually looked down at my arm. You know, I did like a double take. What's going on? And both of us looked at, what was that? And we laughed, what? What happened there, you know? It's like, this wasn't happening. But then I was speaking about Yeshua on the last day of the feast, it says, Hoshana Rabbah, the eighth day, the day when they circle the, 
the altar, when they poured out water and wine at the base of the altar as a sort of like a visible prayer, Lord, bless us with an overabundance of rain, bless us with an overabundance of grapes and crops. And while all that is going on and the people are circling, the priests are circling the, the altar, you know, Yeshua, it says on the great day, the last day of the feast, it says, the only place I think it says this, it says Yeshua stood up in a loud voice. You know, it's like he just yelled this out. And what did he yell? It says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come unto me and drink, for out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This is exactly what Isaiah says. It's exactly what the rabbis have said. It's exactly what the prophets have said. And what they tell us is, what, forget about the New Testament for a moment. What they tell us is, is that that water was representative of the Spirit of God, whom, if He is not poured out on the people, there will be no spiritual rebirth. And if there's no spiritual rebirth, there can't be any, any consistent obedience that would result in God blessing us because we'll be an unrighteous people. And so the rabbis even tell us in Isaiah chapter 12, when it says to draw water out of the wells of salvation. They're talking about the coming of the Spirit of God. And when they prayed for rain, they didn't just pray for the physical rain for the land, but the rain of the Spirit of God that would take hold of our hearts, that we would be restored spiritually unto God. This is what Isaiah says. They needed the breath of life to infuse them with life. And Yeshua is telling them the same thing. Come unto me. Come unto Messiah. Come unto me. Not come unto this synagogue or that synagogue, this congregation. Not come unto me. And out of your very innermost being shall flow. Not a stagnant pond, but will flow rivers like gushing water. Gushing of the Spirit of God in your life. Wouldn't that be amazing to be a conduit of? That we would just be gushers of the life of God? Did you ever meet people like that? Every time you get close to them, and there's something about them that God is here. There's something about them that, you know, there's something else has just happened. It's not just that they're nice. There's something really uniquely spiritual that just happened, and I would like to experience that too. That's what Messiah is saying. When I first preached that, this is why I remember it so well, I said, and out of his belly shall flow livers of riving water. I'll never forget that. Neither will you. Yeah. Now, every time I read, I have to just pause a moment. But don't you want the Spirit of God to gush forth out of your life? You know? Don't we want the Spirit of God to rain down on Israel that it would gush forth in grapes and produce and life? That's what God will do for you and for me if we come to Yeshua. That's why that great invitation, come unto me all you who are heavy laden, I will give you rest. I will give you peace. I will give you life everlasting. Not just long, but everlasting. Not just long, but deep and meaningful and transformative. Today is Sukkot, drawing to the close of it, but it's not yet. We marched the Torah, signifying the Word of God is in our midst. We sang songs of worship and praise. We lit candles. We danced. We did all kinds of things in an attempt to give God the praise and the glory and to draw one another's attention to Him. If you've heard His voice, do not delay. Receive Him. Invite Him into your life and experience the fullness of joy that only one can experience in Messiah Yeshua. So let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for your glorious word, your glorious Savior, and your glorious plan of redemption. Father, on Sukkot, when we celebrate the promise, completion of your work, when you'll bring to finality, all that you have been doing from the beginning to the present and, uh, and beyond. Father, we praise you for it all. 
And we thank you for Messiah who is in our midst, in our hearts. If we acknowledge him, receive him, and recognize him to be the one whom he has claimed to be. Come unto me, all of you who are burdened, heavy laden, desiring for life, because I can give it to you. Even as the people of Israel were praying around the altar for rain, the Lord was there answering their prayer right there. They only needed to turn their attention to Him. If there's anyone here as we're praying, if there's anyone here who's never invited Messiah into their life, and you would like to do that, I'm just going to ask you, just raise your hand very quickly, put it down, not looking too embarrassed, but I want to pray with you. And I want to ask the Lord to be merciful to you as he was to me and to many others. So if there's anyone like that, very quickly, put your hand down and I'll pray for you. And if there's anyone that is saying, you know, I need the Spirit of God like I've never did before, this is a time for you to pray that as well. And so if you know the Lord, you love him, and you're desirous of him in all of his fullness, you can do the same. Just pray, raise your hand, put it down, and I'll pray for you. Okay? Okay? Yep, I see your hand too. Okay? Okay, you can put your hands down. All right, I'll pray for, that, for you. Anyone wants to receive the Lord? I don't, want to, I don't want to move on if there's anyone here that God is still sort of moving around, moving in your heart, you're thinking... We want to pray that you'll have life everlasting. We'll pray for you. We'll pray for you about that. Is there anyone else that's thinking, praying? May God speak to your heart. So, Father, we thank you for your love and your faithfulness. Even as we read in the Psalms, your mercy endures forever. But, Lord, we don't unless we know you. So each moment is a precious one. And each moment is, has eternal significance. So Father, break through where you and only you can so break through. And may your word do its work in helping us, Father, to live for you. So for those that raise their hand to invite you into their life, they need simply pray, Father, I recognize my need for you, that I have been alienated from you. But because of what Jesus, Yeshua, has done for me, I can have life in you. So I repent of my unbelief, my sin, and I acknowledge you for who you are. Help me to walk in your ways. Help me to follow where you lead. Help me to read your word and might you teach it to me that I might understand it more. And then may I be a praise to your name. For those that raised their hand because they wanted to recommit their lives to the Lord, they want a fresh anointing of your spirit. Father, we call upon you that your spirit would have his way in us. And we pray, Father, that you might help us yield more fully and more completely. That you would help us to appreciate and love your grace more and more. And we pray, Father, that we would rely, humbly rely, upon your provision for us day by day and moment by moment. And together we all would say, thank you, Lord, for your goodness and kindness to us. May this Sukkot bring us great joy. And may you, as John had prayed, may you even so come quickly. Bring Sukkot to complete fulfillment. Reign over your people and the nations of the world. And be acknowledged for who you are by both young and old, small and great, Jew and Gentile as the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. For it's in Messiah's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we...
uh, close and as we give him praise, I'll invite our ushers to come and we'll give praise to our God. Man, we have nothing to fear. We shall not be moved. We'll keep walking with the Lord. We'll keep moving down the road because he is coming and he's coming soon. Well, blessings on all you guys. So glad that you're able to come and celebrate with us. Be in prayer tonight. We're up in Valencia. So we have our Sukkot service up there tonight as well. And uh, we have some refreshments over in the Nosh room. So do help you outside, outside, that way. So we head out to the Sukkah and we'll, we'll have some refreshments, some refreshments together. But it's a blessing to see you all. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. It's great to see you. And now receive the benediction. Yivarechech Adonai v'yishmarech Ya'er Adonai panavelecha v'yichunecha Yisa Adonai panavelecha v'yasem lecha Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance, his good pleasure upon you, and grant you his shalom, his peace. B'Shem Yeshua, in the name of Yeshua, HaMashiach, the Messiah, Sar, the Prince, Shalom of Peace. Well, blessings on you, Chag Sameach. By the way, next month at 1 o'clock in the Fireside Room, we'll be starting a Hebrew class. Those of you needing bat mitzvah, bar mitzvah, no matter how young or old, this is for you. Those of you who want to just learn how to read, write, translate some things in the Bible, that's what we're going to be doing. So it'll be a lot of fun. It'll also be great because then more people can do the liturgy. We can get rid of the English transliteration and boom. We'll all be doing Hebrew stuff, you know. Now, we won't get rid of the English, but you'll be able to read it from the Hebrew as well. Anyway, that starts in November. So blessings on you guys, and uh, let's head out to the sukkah. We'll say the blessing, and then we'll all eat together. Hey, thanks for stopping by and watching the message. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you'd like to help support our work, all you need to do is click on the button on top, or you can go to our website at BethREL.org. Hey, listen, take care, and have a great day.